will not need to take attendance. I'll just write it in the sleep. Um, okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, welcome everyone to our um, continued effort to uh, move our conference series to in person. Uh, we have a small group here in Bank 124, but we are here. And um, I see that we um, also have 26 uh, others uh, online. So that's great. Um, we still um, have not solved our um, uh, all of our audio problems. Um, we will still, um, the speaker will still need to um, repeat the questions because um, uh, we don't have a way of um, capturing speaking here in Big One Twenty Four, um, and I don't know how well the audio will come for us. Okay, so um, today is a um, uh, WebEx. Uh, I'm sorry. Today, today is a um, doctoral symposium. Sorry, um, and um, this, as uh, many of you know especially those in the PhD program, that this is um, one of the steps along the way um, in the uh, to starting one's research that culminates in the dissertation and then the uh, awarding of the doctoral degree. So in the um, symposium, the uh, presenter talks it kind of gives us a general overview of the research area that they're developing in and starting to develop a um, possible dissertation topic. Um, the um, student will then work towards um, finding, finding a uh, doctoral advisory committee and um, starting on their research. And so, um, Michael uh, Kolesnikov is going to uh, present his symposium today. At some point in the not too distant future, he'll be back with his um, proposal defense, where he will defend his dissertation proposal. And then at some point further down the road, we'll um, defend his proposal. And if successful, uh, we'll be awarded a PhD and we'll get to march in. Uh, graduation, uh, just like some of you will be able to march this coming June. I will remind everyone again that um, everyone is uh, welcome to attend graduation, both those who are graduating and and others. I intend to be there. Um, and that weekend is also our um, department banquet that we have each year in non pandemic times where um, everyone, uh, including a guest, uh, is invited and you, you already have a save the date. It's the Saturday uh, before graduation and um, um, Lynn is uh, working on a venue and uh, hopefully many of you will be able to make it. Okay, so let me, uh, let me introduce Michael, who, who many of you know since he's been in the program for a while. Um, <clears throat> Before studying informatics, his background is mostly in nursing. He um, obtained a, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Master of Science in Nursing from San Jose State University, uh, specializing as a family nurse practitioner. He then also received um, post-master's training in uh, adult gerontology. And um, when he's not uh, pursuing his studies, he actually um, works uh, part-time um, as a nurse at I was a nurse practitioner here. Okay, full time as a nurse practitioner here. I didn't print out that it's my part. Um, uh, um, background. So um, I will turn it over to him. Uh, he will give us his presentation. There'll hopefully be time for uh, question and answer. And, and again, we're going to have to kind of muddle through the audio uh, issues until we uh, get them fully solved. So go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Before you get started, there's a little bit of vibration in the audio. So I don't know if it's maybe we're too close um, to the microphone or so. But I just thought I'd let you know. How about now? Is it better now? Because I. Probably a little bit too close to the mic then. 
Uh, it's still, I'm still hearing the static. Static, huh? Yeah. I, I mean, the, the sound is great here. Um, are others um, at hearing static? Others out there in WebEx land? Yeah, yeah. I'm hearing static. Yeah. It's only when you speak. We're moving away from the speakers. You've got. Okay. Is that any better? Yes. Yes. That's great. Is that better? Yes. Right. I see one yes. Okay. Better. Okay. Yeah. His cell phone was right next to this. Sorry. Whatever that. this thing is here with the two eyes. Sensitive. Okay. Hi. My name is Mike Kolesnikov, and I'm going to talk about feasibility of using machine learning to predict optimal amount of blood transfusion in trauma patients. And uh, I have a little bit of mixed audience today, so hopefully maybe some. You know, if you want to close that participants window. So I have a little bit of mixed audience today, so there might be some people from uh, my work joining in uh, as well. So I will try to cover some basic uh, things as well. Um, so they kind of some medical things for the uh, machine learning people and some machine learning people for the clinical people. All right. Um, the history of blood transfusion can be div uh, divided into three distinct periods. First is the romantic period and the common theme for this period was blood has supernatural properties and we can hear some echoes of it even now but it started all this european display media where uh, replacing old man's blood would give full rejuvenation to the person and that notion you, you might hear uh, even uh, in modern folk songs and uh, folk stories in shakespeare's king of lear which was uh written more recent uh blood uh, creates some special bond between uh, relatives, especially and uh, uh, King of Lear refers to the blood uh, blood bond um, and be, uh, being betrayed by his own blood and breath. Uh, in Nazi propaganda, even in the 20th century, the blood was seen as a sign of um, intelligence or degeneracy, and uh, it specifically uh, some special blood types they hijacked some. Um, the research of uh, prominent scientists, and they were trying to use this for uh, racial theory propaganda. More recently, even dieting is related to the blood. There are uh, in the uh, dieting by blood type, uh, there are beliefs that uh, people would uh, coming from agrarian or fishermen's or hunter society, they have different type of blood, and that actually creates the adversity in our society. So. Um, in more uh, recent, uh, there is a period of purely experiments this blood, and the common theme of that would be high mortality and questionable benefits. So it started in 1667 uh, when uh, blood was used uh, in two places simultaneously, and uh, they are not related, believed not to be related, but the experiments are really uh, similar. The blood was transfused from an animal from ship to two mental, uh, mentally ill individuals, both of them died. And after that, uh, the blood transfusion was banned for a while. And it's, uh, medicine started to experiment this blood transfusion again in the 19th century. And uh, it was given uh, for treatment uh, conditions such as PMS, melancholy and delusion of lunatics ward, mental health. Uh, and sometimes even for tuberculosis, cancer, and chronic anemia, which for which the blood transfusion could actually be beneficial. Modern time begins in 1901 with the discovery of the four different blood types by Carl uh, Lundsteiner. And it was continued uh, similar. The same discovery was done in 1904 by Ludwig Hirschfeld. He also discovered the four different blood types, but he also contributed by creating a blood acceptance chart. Uh, as you know, there are four different types of blood uh, and O negative blood can be transfused to anybody. Uh, however, there are only 6% of people who have O negative blood. Uh, so that it's a sparse uh, commodity. 
Uh, in the modern uh, science, also starting in the World War I, there was a link between how much of blood a person can lose before onset of shock. And that was believed to be 40% of blood. Uh, if the person, if the sol uh, soldier injured in a battlefield loses about 40% of blood, they begin to go into the shock. And trauma is still the leading cause of death, and hemorrhagic shock is, accounts for over 80% of deaths in the operating room and over half of the deaths in the first 24 hour period. So that's why I believe um, dealing with the blood would be uh, beneficial for our patients. However, blood transfusion is a medical treatment, and like any medical treatment, it has pros and cons. So there are transfusion reactions. When you give too much blood, uh, not too much blood, but when you give um, blood uh, to a patient, they might uh, get uh, urticaria, which is just an itch. Uh, they can get a little bit of fever, uh, and there are, those are mostly benign conditions, but PACO is transfusion acquired uh, cardiovascular system overload. That's a serious complication. Next one is transfusion related acute lung injury. That's also a very serious complication. Sepsis, anaphylactic shock, and hemolytic reaction, those are very serious complications as well. The rate you are seeing here is uh, per 100,000 units transfused. The more blood we transfuse to a patient, the more chances they get to get a, a, a reaction to the blood transfusion. Uh, there are also delayed types uh, like uh, graft versus host disease, which is very rare. And uh, there is another uh, very uh, scary complication of blood transfusion. When I was in school, it was used called uh, li the lethal triad. Now it's a lethal diamond. So um, when a person loses blood, their body temperature goes down. It's a sign of the shock. When the uh, temperature goes down, it's called hypothermia. Hypothermia causes acidosis and it causes coagulopathy. Acidosis when your blood becomes acidic and coagulopathy is the result. When your body temperature is low and your uh, blood pH is getting low, acidic, you get more, blo uh, more bleeding. When you give person a blood, that blood often contains anticoagulation medication, so it prevents it from being clotted in the bag. Uh, and it also, uh, when you bleed, you lose calcium. So, uh, giving more blood to a person who doesn't need it kind of creates a spiral. You get more acidotic, you get more hypo hypothermic, you lose more blood, you get more coagulopathic, and again. So this is another reason why I want to make sure uh, we get enough blood to the patient to resuscitate, but not too much. So I think my research will help to, uh, in the clinical utility, it will help to reduce complications of unnecessary blood transfusion, as well as reducing wasteful practices. Again, blood is rare and improve survivability of the uh, patients. Currently, we predict massive blood transfusions by a few different methods. There are simple and there are complex methods of predicting blood transfusion. The simple methods is shock index, ABC method, and Larson scores. What they have in common is um, sensitivity is kind of low, specificity is high, but uh, they, uh, the shock index is a relationship between heart rate and blood pressure. And uh, ABC method also looks at the mechanism of injury and FAST results. FAST is a focused abdominal ultrasound that's looking for the blood or free liquid in, in the stomach. So once you determine this patient is bleeding in the stomach, you most likely will need blood transfusion. And uh, Larson score is very similar to that. Those um, methods are simple. They are easy to uh, carry out in case of emergency, but they are not very sensitive. Now, what about complex methods of blood transfusion, the determining the mass of blood transfusion? There are a few of them, and uh, I put out the most popular ones. Most of them, they are a chart which assigns you a score. So it's a scale. So a score is being assigned for a heart rate above a certain point, blood pressure below a certain point, 
um, some presence and absence of uh, bone injuries. They are, they are not very sensitive. Uh, they're very specific. But if you compare the two pictures on top and on the bottom, the on top picture, that's the trauma team waiting for the trauma victim coming in. On the bottom, that's actually all hell broke, broke loose because you don't have time to carry out complicated um, mathematical formula in that situation. So my sense, the complicated, uh, complex prediction methods were not used um, currently in practice. However, there are uh, storage for good uh, pre-hospital scoring system prediction method is still on. This is a recent article uh, last year public, uh, publication. And again, we are looking at the uh, mechanism of injury, gunshot wound versus uh, motor vehicle uh, collision, a uh, certain level of heart rate, and certain level of uh, systolic blood pressure. Uh, we assign the score, and this is how we predict need for the uh, massive blood transfusion. All in all, when I looked at different predicting, uh, prediction methods, I found about 30 variables which are used, more or less. Some of them related to the vital signs, some of them related to patient characteristics, and some are lab values, uh, special um, diagnostical studies, and medications, because medications can be blood thinners, patient may be on blood thinners, and even a small injury might require a blood transfusion. And also patients might have medications like beta blockers, which mask the symptoms of shock. Uh, if patient is on a, a beta blocker, their heart rate might be 72 all the way until they go into serious complications from the blood loss. I was lucky enough to get some preliminary data uh, from trauma uh, system, and I did some uh, graphs. And uh, what I noticed is in, uh, in our uh, graphs, they, uh, there are some, um, some variables which are very valuable for, for determining people who need the blood transfusion. And as you can see, the systolic blood pressure, as it goes below 100, it requires, uh, it's strongly correlated with the amount of blood transfused to the patient. Uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, it's another indicator we are looking um, Glasgow Coma Scale assesses your ability to walk, talk, and act. So, normal person like anybody sitting here will be about 15. Me, because I'm a little bit under the stress, will be about 14. This chair will be about 3. 3 is the lowest you can get. So, as you can see, the lowest below 4 was 3, and that's the highest amount of blood needed for the transfusion. So this chair will need to have a lot to be saved. Um, so my research question is feasibility. So is it possible or is it not possible to use machine learning to predict the amount of blood transfusion in trauma victims? And uh, I'm planning to use sequential linear mixed methodology method study. Um, I have a couple of specific aims. Aim number one, what I would like to do is I would like to explore the information used to decide who needs a blood transfusion and how much blood transfusion to be transfused. Uh, what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to go to the um, trauma surgeons, to people specifically who do, uh, who make the decision to transfuse or not to transfuse. And they want, I want to figure out what triggers their blood transfusion, how soon they make this decision, and what triggers to discontinue blood transfusion. Um, my specific aim number two, I would like to use machine learning methods to, um, to analyze the data and to uh, build a couple of predictive uh, analytics. So things like uh, artificial neural network, RNN, and uh, I would like to evaluate the uh, possible predictive uh, properties of different models. What do I mean by that? Um, I had a patient a few, um, few weeks ago who dropped the blood pressure. Patient on the floor, gunshot wound to the uh, leg, dropped the bl blood pressure, had a little bit of fever, got a little bit confused. Um, he was in a hospital for a while, he was not bleeding. My first thought would be maybe he's getting a little bit septic. And I was thinking if 
if I can say, and this patient is getting septic, the computer probably can tell me the same thing, but I don't know how valuable this information would be. What do I need to know at this point? I wanted to know his blood pressure in two hours. So maybe getting the prediction, uh, the diagnosis as the, as the outcome will not be as valuable for the clinicians as certain uh, clinical characteristics in the future. Uh, and this is my aim number three. Uh, I would like to go and talk to the uh, clinical surgeons once I get the models built and once I see what they can produce, I would like to go back to the surgeons and find out how valuable the data I can produce for them. Um, so as far as the qualitative, uh, it's a big part of my research and uh, for the people who are not very familiar with this qualitative, I'll just go over a quick overview. Uh, I'm planning to do purposive sampling. The reason for that is this is a very small group of people who does this decision. They have a special knowledge. They have uh, the insight, and that's what I want to get from them. Uh, I'm planning to do semi-structured interviews. So basically, I'm asking open-ended questions, and I'm looking for the answers in the narrative, not simple yes or no, not simple Likert scale. Um, and then I'm planning to, to use triangulation to establish validity of the answer. So hopefully the data coming through different methods of research, like uh, questionnaire, observation, and interviews uh, will give me uh, similar results and that will uh, establish the validity of the data. And uh, I'm planning to use saturation to discontinue uh, my uh, interviews and the qualitative method uh, starting the first phase uh, once I know new themes are detected. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been lucky to get some data from trauma team, and uh, this is an imbalanced data set. So most of the patients who come through, um, through the emergency room of the trauma victims, they don't need, um, they don't need that blood transfusion only a small portion of them. So um, this is a data set of about almost 600 people and less than 100 of them needed a blood transfusion. I think it's number 87. Uh, and again, when you are looking at the units of blood transfusion, it looks more like survival data because most of the people get about two un one to two units. And there is only one person who needed 37 units of blood transfusion to be transfused. Uh, so that creates a little bit of difficult uh, time for the machine learning to get the uh, hang of this data. Uh, there are different approaches you can use to the data, to the imbalance database. Um, you can increase the sample, you can kind of balance it out, uh, decrease the number of variables. And in my preliminary uh, evaluation, I found out some data is not that useful, like patient height and weight did not correlate with the amount of blood needed for the transfusion. Um, and uh, we can also use, we need to use spe spe specific metrics for this uh, system, sensitivity, specificity, uh, precision rate, and receiver operating uh, uh, characteristic curve, which has been used in many uh, machine learning articles. Uh, and uh, that one basically shows what's the area under the curve. So when you look at the true positives and false positives, you are trying to get as many true positives and as little of false positive identified by, the, by your model. Uh, the perfect skill classifier will be upper left corner. That's when you get close to 100%. Uh, the no skill classifier will be the diagonal line. So it's 50-50. You flip the coin and you get as good results as your model. And uh, then you get better than no skill and worse than no skill. In my preliminary uh, attempt, I got 0 0.64, which is a little bit better than no skill, but uh, I hope to get better than that. Uh, machine learning based prediction of transfusion has been, uh, has got a little bit of attention uh, lately. And this is one of the researchers I found uh, last year. So this article, basically they did, they were non-specific to trauma, but they used uh, sensitivity, uh, they, they used uh, neural network, they used uh, 
logarithmic regression, uh, logistic regression. Uh, they used random forest and they used gradient boost, and they got quite nice results. Um, so this is um, the prediction of a massive blood transfusion was more difficult for them because it's a more difficult task. Uh, so they got low recall rate, but still very, uh, fairly good uh, rock uh, data. Uh, the, in the critics for this research, what I'm trying to say is this is a little bit more simple task than I'm trying to do. When you have under controlled environment, your patient coming for the routine surgery, you know in advance their uh, level of hemoglobin and hematocrit, you know the kind of procedure they are getting, you know how much expected blood loss, and then you can make a very simple decision how much to transfuse or not to transfuse this patient. Uh, I've done it when I was working in the, in the preoperative medicine clinic. This, I mean, you have to do some calculations, but it's fairly simple. Um, it gets more dicey when you are getting a patient coming in an ambulance uh, and you don't know past medical history, you don't know what kind of surgery they will need, uh, all you have is just some uh, uh, preliminary data. Uh, imbalanced data set has also some advantages. There are certain uh, type of machine learning tools we can use to identify outliers. Uh, one of them was um, self-organizing pumps, and the other one is um, uh, variational autoencoders. Variational autoencoders is a generative model. Uh, what it does is um, you get data kind of constrict, uh, constricted from the input all the way to the bottleneck. That's how your system learns the distribution. And when it generates the data back, it tells you if your uh, patient belongs to the distribution it has learned or it belongs to a di different distribution. Uh, it's used to determine uh, fraud on the credit cards and it's also used in the cell phones uh, to clean up the uh, output. Uh, once again, in my preliminary report, I used uh, uh, variational autoencoder and it did show one outlier. And I believe that outlier was the person who had 37 units of blood transfused. Uh, on a self-organizing map, it works a little bit more like um, propensity score. So it kind of, it clusters the data based on all the parameters you give together and it looks for the outliers. On this graph on the left side, you can see the darker the score, uh, the darker the uh, quarter, uh, it's more clo packed close, close together and the lighter the color, uh, that's the outliers. Uh, red circle says the person needed blood, uh, massive blood transfusion uh, and uh, the square says it's not. So as you can see, there are some dark squares who needed blood transfusion, and there are some light squares who didn't. So I don't know if it's going to work. Um, another interesting research I have seen was um, developmental of field artificial intelligence triage tool. That's, they were trying to use artificial neural network, and one of the data points was location of the gunshot injury on the trunk. Looking at that, the machine was able to predict if the patient is going to die, if the patient needs blood transfusion, if the patient is going into the shock. Uh, when I thought about it, I thought, well, injury location is definitely makes a difference. Uh, the type of the uh, injury pattern uh, can determine if the patient is going to die, if the patient will need a blood transfusion, and um, if the patient needs um, more attention than uh, some patients will need more attention than others. And I was thinking, what can we do in the hospital when the patient is admitted to the emergency room? And most of the patients, they do go through the chest x-ray, they do get some abdominal x-rays, and they do get CAT scans. So if the presentation of the trauma pattern important for the determining of the blood transfusion, you might be able to use um, CNN, um, convolutional neural network, uh, and that might help us to do classification later on to figure out if this patient 
uh, certain out, out, outcomes can be predicted based on the uh, X rays, uh, which are not related directly to the number of ribs broken or uh, uh, presence or absence of uh, pneumothorax. Another idea I had was uh, uh, lately uh, there were uh, some use of um, recurrent neural networks, and typically it's used in a few uh, in a few different things. It's a time series, so a most simple uh, example I, I I could think of would be prediction of the cost of the um, stock on the stock market. What you see on this picture is machine is learning the, uh, how the stock market behaves. And uh, the blue one is the uh, actual stock market. Uh, the green one and the green line shows the machine learning how the stock market will uh, pre predict. And the red one, that's actually making the predictions. As you can see, it's not exact, but it shows the pattern. Quite often, the pattern is what we need to see in the clinical picture. Uh, in medicine, it has been used to predict people who are going to develop um, septic shock and blood sugar. Uh, in the blood sugar, it's actually used for artificial pancreas. It gives bolus of uh, insulin based on the uh, predicted value of blood sugar in the uh, next uh, hour or two. Uh, there is also a possibility of using reinforced, uh, reinforcement learning. I don't know if it's going to work. It's a far-fetched. So, um, it's, uh, what's the reinforced learning uh, in simple terms? Uh, it's ability to, uh, ability of a machine to learn how to navigate in the, in the uh, decision domain. So, um, it gets reward for making right decision. It gets punishment for making wrong decision. Now, what's the decision that I mean? If we can dis uh, define every patient's state by the variables such as blood pressure, heart rate, and other important variables, which I will determine in the first uh, phase, then we can uh, see if, um, if the machine can be taught how, uh, which action is the best to be taken under this uh, circumstances. Um, this is how the Tesla self-driving car works. Um, it's a lot challenging. I don't know if I'll get there. And uh, as far as the data, I'm planning to get most of my data from uh, trauma, um, trauma problem here at HSU. Uh, the interesting portion would be if I can get ambulance data, because there are some vital signs taken in the ambulance at some intervals of time, and that actually is a time series I'm hoping to use for the RNN training. Um, how will my approach be different? Well, uh, on the first hand, I'm going to see what, what, what is important to make the decision of the blood transfusion. Uh, and then I will do the statistical correlation, and then I will uh, see uh, what models will work, and uh, um, hopefully I can make some tool. Uh, as far as the timeline, all in all, I'm planning to get at least in a year. But I don't know. Um, on paper, it always looks good. So all in all, this is a feasibility of using uh, machine learning to predict optimal amount of blood transfusion in a trauma victim. Uh, I'm going to do it in three separate steps, explore the information needed, uh, build a few machine learning tools, and find out the usefulness of the tool that I've built. I'm ready for questions. Sure. Can we go back to the slide where you talk about your observations? And, and make sure you repeat the question so the folks on WebEx can hear. So going back to this uh, slide where I had some observations, which ones? Uh, there was a slide where you said I, in my observations. This one? Um, that, that one? It's, it's pretty, it's pretty toward the end. Yeah. It, the, yeah, it's semi structured interviews back there. Yeah, 
in my okay. previous. Yeah, okay. My previous observations, it was, it was, yeah, that one. Uh, this one, okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to know a little bit about how, what, what do you know about the context that this will be used in? Um, especially if things are like, are rushed, then like complex tools, according to at least a good bigger answer, they tend to be thrown out. Um, so, in, in, you know, in good good answers view, one should use like really simple decision trees and stuff that could be like done with paper and pencil. Um, but if, if something more complex is needed, then how is it going to sort of fit into the the the, the ever changing, you know, like so how is it going to change in a random stochastic environment of the emergence room? Right. Okay. So how, how does it sort of you know what kind of context is it? Okay. So the context, uh, I'm not planning to build the actual tool yet. Uh, I'm just planning to see uh, what information can be used. And um, to the clinicians, I mean, I'm my goal is to determine how much of blood needs to be transfused in the first 24 hours. You get the first hour uh, in the emergency room, which is really chaotic. Uh, the decision, in my opinion, is made, um, it's either there or not. So it's, it's, uh, it's made by the uh, clinician's experience and uh, uh, there might be some uh, other hard data used, but my guess was it's, it's like clinician's experience is, is the number one tool. Um, I'm hoping uh, to see if I'll be, I'll be lucky enough to train the uh, recurrent neural network to predict the blood pressure uh, of this patient from admission in the next hour that might help this the decision uh, to be made. So, does that answer your question? I think so. It sounds like there's enough time. It's a 24 hour timeline. Yes, 24 hours is the timeline for the uh, actual uh, prediction. Uh, but, uh, the first, the first two hours are the most chaotic and uh, the most important in the survivability of the patient. Uh, so it's like the golden hour. Uh, if we can get the prediction from the ambulance, if we, if I can, if I can get this data, if, and if I can build the uh, prediction for the next two hours, that that will be a big one. There were some questions in the chat. In the chat, if you go up to the top power. Should I? Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Chat. Oh, yeah, no, that's the. I'm sorry. There it is. Yeah. Okay. You might want to expand that. All right. Um, fascinating public study. Uh, very timely. Do you have any uh, thought on to quantify use of agents such as? Trinexamic acid to increase development of dog reversal agents in your work. Would be interesting if this has any impact on transfusion requirements, which might be anticipated. Uh, very interesting to see how we can this. Okay. Um, that's a good question, yes. Uh, Trinoxamic acid is used uh, as a conservant for the blood and it has anticoagulant properties. Um, this might be one of the things, uh, one of the variables I, I, I will need to use um, to determine the outcome of the blood transfusion and uh, the amount of blood needed for the transfusion. So um, this time I don't know yet, uh, but I definitely, I, I, I want to take a look at the uh, use of anticoagulation uh, in the patients and in the actual blood, blood supply, where it's coming from. Good question. Questions here? Uh, I guess um, I can, um, um, I'm trying to, what, what is the, or I, I know this is your symposium, mm -hmm. so you don't necessarily have to have all the answers, but what what is the, Clinical impact that you're aiming to have. I, I mean, one of the one of the issues I have with a lot of machine learning mm -hmm. is that they're predicting 
you know, they have a good data set mm -hmm. and we're predicting things that we may not be able to do anything about or um, are, oh, that's interesting. And, and sometimes that can be valuable. Um, but is there a kind of clinical scenario you're hoping to um, address? Yes. Um, that your yes. whatever tool you develop would, would result in some improvement in patient outcomes in some way? Yes, yes. Uh, there are. And I don't one. know if the audience, if the WebEx people heard that. Should I repeat the question? So, yeah. what's the clinical uh, benefit of the study, basically? Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm trying to pursue. Uh, I would like to make sure two things happen. Number one, if we can identify patients who need a massive blood transfusion earlier, that can uh, help us to save life, uh, lives. Uh, the reason for that is blood stored in a frozen condition. So we have in the OHSU, we have a blood bank and all the blood is frozen there. Uh, we usually have about one box or two boxes available for emergencies on any given day. Uh, but when the patient is coming and they need like 37 units of blood transfusion, uh, we have to make sure the blood has to be thawed in a very controlled environment, very slow. You cannot cook the blood. Um, and uh, my hope is being communicating this data to the um, blood bank early enough so they can get the blood start start to get it ready and uh, they will know how much of blood to go safely without wasting too much. One more question for Pasta. Okay. Yeah. One of the difficulties to be determined uh, the gold standard. Are you assuming that doctors make the right decision to transfuse or not to transfuse? Doctors sometimes disagree among themselves. Do you have account? With the fuzziness of the correct answer, I this is this is a very good question. So yes, uh, I don't know if uh, the amount of blood transfused recorded in the electronic medical record today is uh, the right amount of blood uh, needed for the patient uh, resuscitation. I mean, if the amount of blood given to the patient was necessary and enough. Uh, this is one of the things I might have to uh, create a special uh, like conference or a discussion topic uh, looking at some uh, cases to determine what the uh, clinicians think about it. Um, at this point, I don't think uh, I can I, I can get a reliable uh, amount of uh, blood. Uh, I, 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 I don't think I can get enough uh, reliable data to uh, say uh, this was this was appropriate, this was necessary. Uh, yeah, I, um, and then there's another question there, but but just to, um, you you may be able to get access. Um, you know, to our data here, we, you know, if, if you have an appropriate project and get IRB approval, you may well be able to get access to, um, you know, data that is in our research data warehouse that that could give you, you know, potentially a much larger data set. I, I you know, we'd have to see, mm -hmm. if, you know, wh where you would find how much transfuse. I don't know if Steve. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can have some data get back in on it. Yeah, I don't know whether they, but they, they may well keep track of. I'm sure it's. They, uh, yeah, they probably keep track of down to specifically which unit, well, like which specific yeah. unit. Yeah. Uh, yes, we, we, we do have, uh, we do have trauma registry and we, we keep track of that. My, my best guess would be uh, if I can get few experts to sit down and go, I mean, it's not too many cases of blood transfusion. It's like 87 uh, in uh, uh, 600. So. We might we might be able just to go through a few of them and figure out if this was enough or not, if this was too much or not. And just in addition to that, mm -hmm. for individuals who did not receive blood transfusion and then had the negative outcome, potentially review those as well to see, you know, do the experts think Thank you. That. Yes, uh, that's a very good point uh, to see those people who did not get blood transfusion had a negative outcome to review those cases too. Thank you. 
Yeah, and then I, I also wonder, you know, you're, you may have uh, a kind of a large number of patients who received more than more blood than they necessarily needed, but also did not have an adverse outcome. And how would you um, kind of distinguish that from patients who had just the right amount of blood transfused? Uh, so, how would I determine uh, those who received too much blood unnecessarily, but did not have a uh, negative outcome? Um, good question. Um, short answer, I don't know. Yeah, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, trally that doesn't happen too often. Uh, uh, that's transfusion related acute lung injury and taco does not happen too often. Um, I, th I think I'll. I'll, I'll try to review as many uh, blood transfusion cases with the experts as, as, as possible to see, um, at least to find the common themes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Christina has a question here. Sure. The outcome, um, it sounds like you have a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. Something like the feature selection to see which one is cut off the threshold to see good condition versus bad. Um, I don't know how you. Um, good point. I saw you had like a company. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Another question about your data. Um, so I'm on the bioinformatics side. So I'm just go, go, I'd ask. Just like data from the EHR that you collect certain parts, which is the data you collect, which it comes from the EHR. What's the, what's the data the source? Yes, the data source, uh, where the data is coming from. Uh, right now, I have data coming from the registry. And uh, trauma trauma system has a special registry. So they put uh, most of the what is believed to be important data today uh, into the special uh, database system. So uh, when I look at it, uh, I have some vital signs, I have diagnosis, uh, I have uh, amount of blood transfused, whether the, the patient survived or not. I mean, uh, it's extensive. You you can find lots of data there. What I'm, uh, and this is the data I have used for my preliminary search. What I'm planning to get is access to the actual uh, EPIC database and dig in there and uh, look through that. I mean, the, 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 the only way to get a good reliable data is manually go through the records and uh, review them. And I know it's not a cheap proposition, but you know, <laughs> I have at least a year. So the, um... Mm -hmm. Kingdom made a comment about four comments up, and that then he okay. Also, let me see. Uh, the, the RDW definitely does have transfusion information. I'm not saying it's not. It's not in the OAuth instance, so I could be looking at that. Just what to make a comment? What uh, challenging? Overfitting as well, yes, thank you. Yeah, overfitting with the dealership, especially the certain models. Uh, the other challenge is that you're going to see a difference in transfusion practices, even among clinicians. I have seen ED doctors to do it differently. My practice has changed to go because of an inter internist to intensivist. It's also hard to give consistent uh, physiological reasoning behind transfusion decisions. Yes. Thank you. Very good comment. Uh, Alan Chen, uh, you can abstract cases and have a number of experts decide whether or not to transfuse. Check their agreement rate and compare your system to them. Thank you. This is very good. Yes, I have seen something similar done in one of the research articles on the eye diseases. Uh, that was the use of RNN to determine, um, I, think I think glaucoma. Um, yes, uh, and that that was a panel uh, who was classifying cases and making the diagnosis, seeing if the uh, CNN will do better. 
Thank you. Uh, and from Chenga last year in SCCM, I saw a company came up with a software from which you can get real-time advice for massive consumer and protocol. I'm not sure they use AR or not. Uh, you know, I have not seen that one specifically, but I'll be very interested to take a look at it. Thank you. More questions? Fire away. Yes. Um, gave some reasons earlier why um, too much blood was bad. Yes. Uh, could you use those symptoms? And I assume there's like official adverse event ratings, but often isn't there are symptoms that maybe don't rate an adverse event, but make everybody on the floor go, oh boy, you know, we need to watch this. Mm -hmm. Could you pull those data points out? And use it to assess if somebody had too, you know, too much blood, too much blood, but maybe not an adverse event. Okay. So is it too much blood if they don't have an adverse event? I mean, if they're okay, I mean, maybe wasteful, but but is it medically bad? Okay, that's a good question. Two questions. Number one is, is it medically bad to give too much blood? And the second question is whether or not I can. Uh, find the data set, data points which determine if the patient had too much blood. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, let me ask, uh, answer the first question. Is it too bad to give uh, unnecessary blood? Yes. You talked about that, but if nothing goes wrong. If nothing goes goes wrong, yes. Um, Would it still too much blood? Yes. Uh, let, let me explain. Let me explain. Um, physiologically, our body can lose certain amount of blood and it can be stored. When we give unnecessary blood to the patient, uh, by the mechanism we don't exactly understand yet, uh, it suppresses the blood uh, the uh, blood production, the bone marrow, and it has some uh, autoimmune uh, response. So um, even nothing, e even if nothing but has happened, uh, it's still uh, not good. And it also, uh, one in 12 patients will develop uh, antibodies to, uh, to the blood given. And antibodies, I did not cover it in my presentation because it's a little bit too specific, but uh, it's a bit, big thing. Uh, next time the blood transfusion uh, you have to give to this patient might get bigger complications. And you have to determine if the patient has uh, uh, antibodies and it takes a very long time to determine which antibodies they have. So in case of emergency, it's a big deal. Uh, and in case of uh, plant surgery, it gets things more complicated. And then the blood also has to be liquidly used. You uh, wash out the leukocytes, the blo uh, white blood cells from the red blood cells to reduce the amount of complications for those people. It's more expensive. And the uh, second part of your question is uh, whether or not I can uh, find the data points which can identify it. I don't know. I might, I might not. I think you that would... You don't know what the data points are or you don't know if you can get them? I don't know what the data points are. I think I will need to go to uh, talk to uh, surgical uh, specialists and uh, intensivists to find out what they think about it. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay, a couple more questions here. What did I have? Uh, you can. Yeah, no, they, they, they. Oh, wait, no, I guess there are more. Okay, uh, abstract cases. Okay, we got that. We got that. Last year, yeah, we got that. And Nina, it seems we need a good adverse event classifier to determine your cases and controls. Uh, I assume when you say, even if nothing has happened to me, that there was no severe outcome. And milder events may count uh, as cases, right? Yes, Mina, you are right. Uh, yeah, milder events uh, and even future events uh, from the blood transfusion, like developing of the um, antibodies, will count and not necessarily we will know about it upon the first transfusion. Okay. 
Next. Okay, well, I don't hear any more. I actually want to ask um, Lynn, Lynn, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. This thing, whatever this thing here is, maybe not. Um, yes, I can hear you. Or actually, can anyone hear me? Anyone out there in WebEx land? Yes, we can hear you. Is the RTC yes. looking thing in my We can hear I you. I think so. Well, maybe not. Maybe <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's that? You. Oh, you can. not Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, <laughs> maybe take a minute. Uh, yeah, it's it's here. Testing. So, um, can you, I can see the. Can you I can hear see me the... now. Yes. I see a picture. Yeah, I see Lynn. Is that? Karen's on video. <laughs> Karen's thumbs up. Okay. Maybe stop sharing. Yeah, maybe stop sharing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about if I go back here? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Plus minus, Vishnu, I see your face. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, well, actually, whenever this thing is here, I see a picture of me. Is there, where is that camera coming from? This one. Oh, oh, it's coming from this. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, we can see whatever you. Whatever this know. is, um, actually, this may help solve our problem. And um, Michael. So, um, Okay, well, anyways, um, so I think we're um, almost at about time. I want to um, thank Michael for an interesting presentation, and I think we're all, we'll all look forward to see how this evolves. And um, um, we'll, we'll adjourn for today, and um, thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, maybe this.